So I wanted to share something uh, cool. I did. I, I haven't done the tape out yet, but I've actually submitted a design for a tape out. Now, this is something I've done multiple times in my life, but this is the first time I've done it using the open source tools, Xgame, Magic, and sort of the Skywater PDK. Now, usually a tape out costs, I don't know, let's say $10,000 or on that order of magnitude, depending on the technology. It may cost $10 million if in the right technology, but it's quite expensive. But there's a guy called uh, Matt Venn and others. He's made something called Tiny Tape Out. And that's been going for quite a while. But what was different now in February was that I learned that <laughs> there was this uh, Tiny Tape Out 6. And for the first time, they were going to include a template for analog designs. So you could actually sort of go to GitHub, you can go to the analog and mix signal template, and you can create your own design. Now, when you do a tiny tape out, you get a certain area. And let's see, what is it? Uh, 160 times 100 micron. It's probably uh, twice that. <laughs> it's two of these tiles, I think. Yeah. Anyway, you get a price of relatively, well, it's still, it's still a cost, but it's not sort of insanely expensive. It's doable for a private person if you're motivated enough, because it's, it's a few hundred dollars. Now, when I learned about the fact that it was possible to do analog tape outs now, that got me a bit fueled, um, fired up. <laughs> and also Matt uh, mentioned that, well, he asked if I had anything that was sort of ready to go. And I thought, well, maybe I have something. Maybe I have a success approxim approximation ADC, and that's what I want to tell you about today. So the goal of today is really to walk you through the SAR and to walk you through sort of the steps necessary to do the tape out on Tiny Tape Out, and let's see where we go. Before we go into the detailed slides, I want to show you one thing. So on the 16th of February, which is a bit, I guess, uh, a week ago. I sort of started playing around with the idea of, could I do a tape out? And I want to show you something. Let's see if this works. Let's go. Uh, no, not Zoom. We want that one. So, <clears throat> so here you can see me starting to download the template. And then luckily I had some holiday. <laughs> So I could actually take my success approximation ADC and put it into a tiny tape out. Now I had to do quite a bit of modifications because initially I had a 9-bit ADC, but that was too big. So I had to reduce it to an 8-bit ADC. But pretty much yesterday I submitted my design to the tiny tape out 6. And you can actually find it in the uh, repository for tiny tape out under here, and there is my GDS. So it's now, it's in on the design and it's ready to be taped out. It's probably gonna require a few modifications, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so let's go into a bit about the idea because it's not possible to make uh, ADC in one week, although I did. But that's because I started way, 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 way back when. This design started a long, long time ago. So it turns out back in 2009, here in Trondheim, Norway, there was a conference. And at the conference, there was a guy called Lanny Levin. I wrote a paper together with him, him and a few others um, back in those days. And he is sort of an expert on nanoscale design designing in nanoscale technologies. He's one of the guys that made the ADC in Hubble. Now he showed me this layout at that conference and in that paper. 
And looking at this layout, I sort of realize something. This is a very regular structure. The layout <clears throat> that you're looking at right now is hand drawn, but I realized that I could probably code this. So I, I knew programming, well, at least at that time, I was using Perl and other languages. And I was pretty sure I could actually code up a system to generate the layout. And since then, that's something I've been working on. Now, I was sort of playing around with the ideas. I was working at Nordic Semiconductor at that time, which I, <laughs> I still am, but not really playing seriously with the idea until my professor, Tron Itterdal, back in 2014, he said, well, do you want to do a postdoc? <laughs> so yeah, of course I wanted to do a postdoc. So I did that for a few days a week while I had my job at Nordic. And the goal was to create uh, analog to digital converters, but I didn't want to create any analog digital to digital converter. At this point in time, I actually worked on SARI DCs in Nordic. And I didn't want to do the layout again because I realized that it's an insane amount of effort to redesign something in a new technology. And it seemed like an incredibly waste of work. So I wondered if I could encode into something, I didn't know what, but into something, everything I needed to know, know in order to generate the ADC. But of course, I didn't just want to compile an ADC that was done before. I also wanted to make sure that it actually was state of the art. It was comparable to state of the art performance. And in order to do that, you first need to figure out what do you, what do you, what sort of specs should you go for? What you're looking at right now is a figure of merit plot with the Walden figure of merit. It's a sort of a standard figure of merit for analog uh, to digital converters. And there was this sort of space in that, at that time, there was a space in the plot. And I thought, okay, let's put something in there. Find an application that fits, like uh, radio receivers, and get a sample rate of about, well, two to uh, 20 megahertz and make an ADC. So the circuit I made is not that advanced. I mean, SARS were really popular at this time, but there was a couple of tricks I, of course, had to add in order for this to be publishable. So one of the things that was quite common was to do an asynchronous loop. So the bit cycling in the SAR, where you do the binary search, most people at that time, they did it with a sort of self-time self loop. So you had a sample clock that came from externally, that sampled your input voltage on top of a capacitor array. And then there was a comparator clock, which was generated simply by a delay loop in order to do bit cycling. And bit cycling in this, in this case is just uh, flipping the one of the plates of the capacitors from VDD to ground, for example, and vice versa, to, in order to redistribute the charges or redistribute the voltage and get a voltage change at the input of the comparator. We might see that in the plot later on. One of the tricks I employed in my paper was to include the bottom plate of the capacitor in the clock generation. Now, what this does is that it actually makes it easier to port to a different, different technology because as the capacitors and um, comparator delays and sort of the whole system changes with voltage and parasitics, and absolute capacitances and so on, then the delay would change and the, the, the ADC would still work. So diving a bit deeper into the design, this is how it looks. So in the repository for the TT06R, there is a link to the paper on IEEE Explorer. I would recommend that you go and read that if you're sort of interested in the design techniques. But these days, there's nothing really special about the ADC itself. Just quickly run through, so it has a couple of bootstrap switches sampling the differential input voltage on top of the capacitor array, the initial state of the bottom plate of the capacitors, or the other plate of the capacitors, is set by these logic cells. And these logic cells is what you see below. And these use a kind of tr a true single phase clock type of system, which means that uh, the state information is actually just stored on the gate source capacitances. For example, this A state, we reset it when the clock is sampling. 
and then this A is high. And then when we enable this first stage, that's sort of enabled by the clock going low, it waits for the comparator to make a decision. Because the comparator in the reset phase, both the P and N will be low, so these transistors will be turned off, and one of them will turn on. Which means that there's really only a voltage at the node A for a limited duration. It's sort of a... It's just stored in charge for a little while. Which means that you kind of have to be a bit careful, and if you, really, if you reduce the sample rate too much, then maybe the state information here, the A, leaks out and so on. Anyway, what we can also notice is the bottom plate of the capacitors, shown here, DP0, DN0, that also is connected to the PNN, so when the comparator makes a decision, it flips the bottom plates of the capacitors. And then the bottom plates of the capacitors, this DN0, for example, is also included in the clock loop for the comparator, which is sort of the uh, C, I, C, O parts here. So that's actually sort of a ripple thing all the way from the first logic block to the last logic block, clocking the comparator and resetting it again. So that means this SAR is self-timed. You run in a sample clock, you <laughs> set it low, which enables the bits like bit cycling, and it goes through all the stages. And when it's done, then you have your digital results. The comparator, that also is relatively simple. It's a, this is a strong arm latch. So we have a latch up here, back-to-back uh, -back inverters, which are reset to VDD. And then there's also a differential input stage, uh, NMOS differential input stage. Now, that us, this actually means that the common mode of the ADC matters. So w if you're going to apply an input signal to this ADC, you actually have to make sure that there is a common mode on that input signal. And it's probably, well, a bit lower, gives you lower noise, a bit lower speed, and so on. So it's a bit sort of fiddly to get right. And usually in a real sort of system, you would have a driver for this ADC. Although it's quite easy to drive because the capacitors are quite small. Anyway, also in this comparator, there also is a kickback compensation because every time the comparator makes this decision, there is sort of a kickback onto the top plate of the capacitors and that has to settle out. So it's, it's trying to reduce the amount of kickback that comes back. Especially if that kickback is asymmetric, then it introduces a possible, at least an offset, maybe even a nonlinearity. So that's how the, the circuit works. Again, go and read the paper if you really want to look at the circuit in detail. But when I originally taped this ADC out in, I think it was 2015, it was a 28 nanometer FDSOY, SD technology. I didn't tape out just one ADC, I taped out nine ADCs. And I measured all of them, but only uh, one of them, the nine bit, really had state-of-the-art performance. And that sort of came back to there is a power consumption that is pretty much determined by the size of the capacitors. So how much is, is necessary to drive the capacitors and then how much is necessary to, to drive the digital logic. So if you make the same 9-bit ADC in a different technology, for example, Sky 130, then it will not be state-of-the-art because you're spending a lot more on driving the digital gates. So there maybe you have to increase the resolution in order to get uh, state-of-the-art type of performance. And maybe you won't even get state-of-the-art performance because the transistors are so much larger than in 28 nanometer FTSY. But making nine ADCs is non-trivial. <laughs> and here, I guess, is the trick and really what made this paper interesting for most people was that the ADCs was compiled so up until that time, there were compiled ADCs, and so you sort of start with some sort of uh, machine-readable source information, and from that machine-readable source information, you produce the full layout of the ADC. Now, what was new in, with my design at that time was that I got roughly the same performance as the best ADCs at that point in time. So... 
figure of merit was equivalent to Peter Harper's type of ADCs, and that's pretty good. So, <clears throat> not that high resolution, but pretty good form, and it was compiled. So what do I mean by compiled? Well, it's really about taking everything I knew at that point in time about making ADCs and putting it into <laughs> some text files. And also making a compiler, a transpiler. Uh, it's a compiler? Yeah, I think it's a compiler in order to generate the layout. So way back when, I, for some reason, I chose Perl. Probably because that's what was I coded in at that time, point in time, in 20, this was 20, probably t from 2009 up to 2014, I've sort of started the work on this um, Perl script to generate layout. So I ended up with about 16,000 lines of Perl. Now, this was a closed source uh, type of project because I had started the work at Nordic and then continued it uh, at Antenu and license agreements and blah, blah, blah. So that Perl script is not available to the public. But it did sort of... The thinking... <laughs> I wanted the thinking to be open source. So... I ported to C++ for speed and sort of started fresh, not looking at my old code, and made the compiler again in C++. And of course, tried to reuse the same concepts as I had for the original compiler. So the same netlist, the same spice netlist, which gives me the connectivity and also the placement information for cells, and what I called an object and layout description file in JSON. So that's it's basically an object file. We'll have a look later. So you put that into the Perl script, but then, of course, you need something to tell you what is the technology, kind of. And here it actually goes all the way back to uh, Lambda rules and um, Carver Mead and his work sort of early on <laughs> with layout, uh, with sort of rules where you define a parameter or the sizes, like the metal width, for example, you d define that to be a certain number, let's say 12. And then depending on the technology, you have a scaling factor in Ongström. So it turns it into the right size for that particular technology. So if you do that for all the different DRC rules or design rule check rules, it turns out that quite often you can port things from one technology to another technology just by changing one number. The challenge back in 2014 was that I couldn't really share these technology files with anybody because I was using SD28 nanometer FDSOI. That is definitely closed source. It's NDA. Uh, under NDAs, you can't show the technology. So that also meant that it was difficult for other people to use who weren't at NTNU and it pretty much, pretty much was difficult for people to use. What happened a few years ago was, of course, Skywater 130, and that inspired me to port this whole system and the te technology files to Skywater. But let's go through a little bit how this works. So, at the fundamental level, what I'm trying to do is to encode into a set of text files everything I need to know in order to generate a layout. There is no intelligence in here. <laughs> this is this predates AI. This is stupid compiler. It is not any cleverness anywhere in the system. But still, I wanted to have a complex SAR. So how do we do that? Well, you start by making simple rules. And one of the simplest rules I made was I had to define the transistor somehow. So I ended up doing that as ASCII. And just saying, okay, I know that any transistor, particularly in this technology, it'll it's going to have OD, which is diffusion. And those are going to be, you want something that looks like this. So there's going to be some OD over here. There's going to be, this is going to be the bulk contact or the substrate contact. And there's going to be some OD underneath the transistor. Then there's going to be some poly. And I, I wanted at that time, I also wanted uh, poly dummies. 
because particularly in 28 nanometer you have lith lithography effects where if you don't have the same spacing between all the polys you get diffraction patterns that can mess with your I guess matching mostly and then you ha have some metal on top of the transistors and this ASCII sort of gives enough information to encode the properties of the layout that you're seeing. And then we have sort of a slightly different uh, namings for things. So for example, drain, well, that's drain, a D is drain, <laughs> source, gate, and that gives me enough information to add ports. So with that compiler, all I needed to do, or do today actually also, is give the compiler the size of the vertical grid and the horizontal grids. And that's sufficient for the layout to be generated. So we can see here the poly, well, it's gonna look like this. The, the actual grids, that's the size of a unit ASCII, <laughs> the size of a character <laughs> in physical space. Okay, so now we have one transistor and we can get generate flavors, PMOS, NMOS, by adding implant layers. But that also means that at that time, I made a decision to only use one tra transistor, one PMOS, one NMOS in my SAR design. Nothing else was allowed. I was allowed multiples, so parallel combination of multiple uh, transistors, but no change in size. And that had the effect of making my layout quite regular. So what you're looking at right now is a inverter. We can recognize the, well, I actually don't know which one is the PMOS and which was, the, which was the NMOS. I think I'm using, well, there's an N well underneath the left one here and that could actually be the NMOS <laughs> because this is FDSOI technology. Anyway, that's not the important part. Encoding into the vert inverter, what I need is a spike net list which tells me the connectivity. So here I have my uh, NMOS transistor, I have my PMOS transistor, and the way the placer in the compiler works is that it takes the first line and it places the device. Then it looks at the next line and it says, okay, is the first part, what I call the group name, of the instance name the same as the previous one? In this case, no, it's not. It's MP instead of MN. Okay, then I step to the right and place it there. If it was the same, for example, if it was another NMOS, then I place it on top. Okay, so <clears throat> that's enough to place the devices, just the spice net list. But I also need to route it up. In the beginning, I used what I called directed routes. This is similar to how routing is done in text. But the principle is, use metal one and the net, Y, find the drain of the any device that starts with MN and has a drain. So that's gonna be this rectangle. And then route sort of a, let's see if we can find the camera, that way, that way, that way, over to any M uh, PMOS uh, to the drain. So that creates this route. So I don't need to tell it where the rectangles are because it already knows that. It knows where the physical rectangles are on the transistors. I just need to f tell it how to find the rectangles and, and how they should be routed. Note that this routing in the compiler is insanely stupid. It does not understand anything about metals or, well actually it does understand how to transition from one metal to another metal, but it doesn't know how to avoid other metals. It's completely blind. It'll do exactly what you tell it to do. And this is a bit tricky to do actually. It, it takes a bit of time to, it's a bit finicky. But once you have your inverter, then you don't really need to change it anymore. Once it's there, you actually can easily port it from the one technology to the next. Now the transistor itself, that is actually quite a bit of work. But by doing this sort of very regular structures and making sure there are very simple rules for how to route, route up the design, you can create more complex designs. So <clears throat> what you're looking at now is a slightly more complex cell. 
maybe this is a bit small. Let's actually try and make it bigger. See if I can do that. Does it have a zoom? Just a second. I'm going to find the zoom button. Okay, hopefully this is a bit more visible. So let's have a look. Let's start with the net list. So here we can see we have multiple NMOSs, four, and we have four PMOSs. So if we go down to the layout, we can see that the first NMOS in the Spite net, net list is placed bottom left, and then the next NMOS, next NMOS, next NMOS. And this just is just placed on the, based on the name. And then the PMOSs, well, it'll jump to the right and do that again. And that is the information that is extracted from the Spice Netlist. In addition, it now knows the connectivity, how the different nets re or rectangles relate to it each other. It doesn't actually know how to route it up, though. So we have to tell it that. And that's what we're doing in the JSON file. So, for example, for the nets called N1 and N2, well, if you just route them straight down, then you'll be fine. <laughs> that will work. And that's what you can see here at the ones. Now the two, that's net three, just route that like a U kinda. Notice that, let's see, if I, yeah, there's three nets. So N3, N3, and N3. And it knows there are three. So it just routes all of them. And that's the two here. So you don't have to tell it much. And the expressions here are actually regular expressions, so it's, it's quite easy to, to give it a class of larger <laughs> sets. The uh, EO, so that's number three, let's see where that is, that's just route. Actually here I'm telling it, uh, choose the rectangle that is most on the right <laughs> as the start rectangle. There is a bunch of options in the router to give it sort of, try to direct it to do the right thing. But it, notice that there is no size information here. It knows from the rule file how much to extend the metal from where the transistor is, based on the spacing, and route it up, and so on. And maybe for those um, of you that have done quite a bit of layout, I'm also breaking one of the cardinal rules of layout, uh, where you sort of say, okay, if you route metal 1, then it's horizontal, metal 2, vertical, metal 3, horizontal, and so on. That's just a rule to make sure that you do, don't get into corners that you can't get out of. And that actually does happen with a compiler. Sometimes it's quite hard to figure out w how to route out the cell. Notice also that I did a slight modification in order to create my to create routing channels. I placed the AVDD and AVSS on top of the design in metal, uh, in my case, metal four. So one, two, three, four. So that means I have a routing channel in the middle. I have a routing channel, be channel before the gates and also outside the gates. And that just gave me enough oh, wiggle room in order to route up most, most things. Now, in the beginning, I did quite a lot of directed routes, so that the, the trouble with what I call directed routes is that there it doesn't care about the spite net, spice net list. So it'll just tell the uh, system to route from the um, MN1 gate to the MP1 gate. That's going to be, let's say, MN1, that's this one here. But it, it doesn't check the spice net list the connected route or connectivity routes, that is actually something that checks the spice net list and takes from the connectivity in the, in the, the graph kind of <laughs> spice net list and then generates the, uh, the layout or routing. This is a very manual process, but you can actually create quite complex things using this method. method. I'm not claiming it is e easy though. But I did end up creating then nine different SARS. Also had the play of using both uh, 180 uh, 20, uh, FTSOI transistors and 28 nanometer FTSOI transistors using pretty much the same input file, just changing the rule file. Since that time, I've, I've taken those original designs, the SPICE file, the object definition file, 
and the rule file and just change the rule file. Sometimes I had to modify the compiler. Uh, for example, when I ported to 22 nanometer FTSY, 22 nanometer has double patterning, which makes it slightly harder to make the transistor. I've done 28, I've done 65. It's been taped out in both 28 nanometer FTSY and 55 nanometer FTSY. So when I found the Skywater PDK, I was really happy because finally I could put it everything out there open source. I, I am a big proponent of sharing what I know because I only have a finite number of years on this earth and most of what I know will be forgotten and lost. <laughs> Maybe even by me. I, I, I still forget things that I did 10 years ago, right? So I, I try to write things down and I try to share it as soon as I can, like this video. So I made the sorry to see, ported that to Skywater. Okay, now we're up to present day, almost. But I want to give a few key learnings from this compile process. The fact that I used a super simple way of defining a transistor was a great advantage because anything above the transistor, like the inverters, definition of the SAR, how everything worked and the connections between them, as long as I kept roughly the same structure, then I could port very easily or relatively easily between technologies. So what you're looking at is the original, on the, on the right side, the original transistor from 28, 28 nanometer FDSY. And you can see the structure of the OD is quite similar to the structure. Well, actually, look at the metals. Of the metals is quite similar to the metals that I have in Skywater. Now, of all the technologies I've ported to, sorry, Skywater was probably the most tricky one because in Magic there's sort of this definition of this is the gate contact, or this is the gate of the transistor. This is the source contact. This, this is the gate contact. It's it's quite a lot of layers. <laughs> so the, the base transistor, the DMOS, that's quite different between FDSY and Sky130. But once that was defined and was GRC clean, then it's relatively easy for me to generate the full ADC. So what you're looking at right now is two source files for the comparator and the object for the comparator on the left side from the 2016 compiler and the 2022 when I actually made the Skywater one. You can see they're slightly different. What's important is that the director, directed routes, that's very, very similar. I actually haven't checked if they're exactly the same, but they kind of look exactly the same to me. And there's a couple of new functions in the C compiler, naturally. But it's a real advantage in order to be able to generate stuff from what I made in 2016, now in 2022 or 2024, <laughs> without much change. But using the system is pretty hard. My experience, so I, I know quite a bit, I know quite a few analog engineers. So I've been in the been in Nordic since 20, 2000, 2008, so that's 15 years, and I spent seven of those years as the um, wireless group manager, which means I hired analog designers. So I got, I think, pretty good at recognizing good analog designers. But what surprised me was that even though you have extremely bright analog designers, they don't necessarily have a brain for coding. That seems to be slightly different. <laughs> So very few of them actually have the combination of being a coder, knowing programming quite well, and knowing circuits. And it's really only if you have a combination of those two that it even becomes possible to use this technique. And some of them have. Some of them ha uh, have used this system. I want to go through a bit <clears throat> how it works in a bit more detail maybe. So, of course, you need the idea, you need the architecture, you need to figure out what you want to make. Sometimes that is best done just by playing around with schematics in XCAM and doing some simulations and so on. As soon as you have the architecture, 
or the circuit that you want to make, then you have to get the spice file and you have to then start building it up, making the layout and start routing the um, nets in the object definition file and also the technology file, sort of define how that's going to work. And then you put all of those into CIC creator and out you get a CIC file. That's basically also a JSON file, but that's where all the rectangles have been placed and all the devices have been placed and is really only an intermediate format. Because, well, in the original compiler, I actually made GDS and I made a uh, skill in order to load into Cadence, but when the open source tools came around, I had transitioned into using an intermediate JSON format as sort of the yeah, what should I say, the compiled file. Because quite a lot of stuff what ha that happens afterwards, like making the schematics and making the symbol and making the magic files, that's kind of like a transpiling operation. You're taking something that's already defined, rectangles and so on, and you're translating it into a slightly different format. And since I have one format coming out of the CIC, well, Basically, I didn't. I tried at one point to have different formats coming out of CIC, which is in C++, but that just takes a lot of time. <laughs> writing C++ is hard compared to writing Python. It's just that it's a lot faster. So the actual translation or transpiling from the CIC format over to, uh, over to uh, Magic and so on, that's done by Python, which makes it also easier to maintain. There's a sort of an intermediate format here in the CIC, which means I can actually view that in a GUI that I made in Qt and C++. And then once you have the actual designs in your standard schematic and layout tools, then it's easy to run the backend tools like simulation, parasitic extraction, uh, layout versus schematic, DRC checks, virtual inspection, and so on. So let me do a slight demo on how this works. Where am I? Okay. So if we go into IP, we go into Sun and into work. Actually, mm, yeah, I'll do that. I, th I think I'll do that later. <laughs> Let's close a bit stuff down here. Clean it up a bit. Okay. So into work, in order to compile, I do a make IP. I love make files. As I said before, I easily forget stuff. <laughs> but there is one thing that I've been persistent. Is that the right word? Or consistent is probably more right, more correct. <laughs> Every time I've done a command, I've usually met written a make file which means that anytime you find a folder where, I, where I've done something, there will be a make file in there. And even in the uh, Skywater setup, I've made a bunch of uh, commands. Let's see if we have it here. Oh, that is too large. And it's going to be quite confusing. Anyway, it's just a quick way of writing down the commands I want to use so I don't have to remember them. But if we look at the make IP, which is where I generate the ADC, then you can see that I do that in design. So let's just go to design. And then I run CIC. So CIC is the CIC creator. There's links in the repo to that and you have to compile that in, in C++. But actually, let's run that. So now it runs and it generates the CIC file. So if I do an ls-lt, you can see that what's been generated right now is CIC. Yeah. In order to get the other formats, then you have to use the CIC pi. So here's the actual transpiling, where it turns the CIC file into a SPICE file, 
Verilog, that's in beta, and it doesn't really work that well yet. Magic, Xchem, and then there's some extra options just for Skywater. But let's have a look at the CIC file. So the, in the CIC creator, there is also a GUI. And let's see if I can... Ah, I forgot the technology file. Sky130. Okay, now the GUI should pop up. Here we go. And here you can see the inverter. So actually, let's start with that. And let's put that in the background. Okay. And let's disable some of the um, <coughs> layers. Okay, so now we're looking at the inverter. We can see all the cells here. And we can go all the way up uh, to the 9-bit SAR, which is the full thing. And the whole thing here is generated. It's LVS DRC clean. And then we have the 8-bit SAR. And here you can see sort of the difference in the what I had to do over the last week. I had to take this 9-bit and reduce it to an 8-bit because the 9-bit actually was too large for the um, tiny tape out uh, one by 2 tile. Let's have a look at the... Let's see. I want to go here. And I want to go to IP, Sun, CIC. And let's start with the technology file. This is probably a bit too large font. Let's hope you can see that. Or maybe it was okay. <laughs> uh, let's do 30. Hopefully this is big enough for whatever screen you're looking at. Anyway, this is the a JSON file. And it is the technology information about the Skywater technology. So for example, let's find Poly. Here, it uh, has an alias, poly. That's what it uses in the magic files. The actual number and data type, that's not used. <laughs> but it's just there because uh, CIC creator expects them. It has a material option just to say, okay, this is a poly. It has a previous and the next. So it knows how to route from a poly to a, well, the next layer up in the stack, which is contact. And what the pin is and what the color should be in CIC GUI. So we have all the different layers. You have the local AI, local eye. So I use my names for the layers in my object definition files. So M1, M2, that is translated into the local interconnect, uh, metal one, metal two. So here there's a mismatch, for example. And when, when you use metal five in Skywater, it's actually Metal 6 in my system. But that's just a mental mental thing. In addition to the layer definitions, there is this scale parameter that I talked about. So gamma is the thing that actually changes the size of everything. So it scales all the dimensions in this rule file with the gamma. And then we have a couple of other things. For example, how a metal resistor looks and how to generate the spice properties for that. Or the circuit, what's, what's for example, what's the ports of a transistor and which order do they come in, which are the parameters that you need for the transistor, like the width and the length, that actually, well, usually that's the same thing for different um, foundries, but quite often for resistors, it is different. And then I have some symbol libraries in order to get pretty symbols. And then we have the actual definition of the horizontal and vertical grid for our transistors. So by s changing a single number, let's do something stupid. Let's make it really big. And let's uh, generate... Oh, wrong directory. So I think now... Well, uh, the CIC creator doesn't know rules and neither does the CIC pi. And now I actually generated all the magic files, so I sort of screwed up my design. If I reload, we should see a pretty big difference. And it should look quite stupid. Yeah, suddenly my transistors are ridiculously wide. This is probably not DRC clean. Actually, it'd be fun to check. Is it DRC clean? Let's go to the top level in the ADC. 
uh, or in the uh, tape belt. TT06, work, magic, assign, TT. Let's open that up. And let's peek it. Yeah, <laughs> now it's definitely not DRC clear. So now I've screwed up my whole design. <laughs> it's now non-functional, right? 3,000 DRC errors. Ah. So, but what we can see is that we have very weird transistors. Let's zoom in. Okay. But this is how I play with the dimensions in order to get something that is DRC clean. So I know that this used to be 18. Let's go back to that. Let's generate the EDC again. Uh, let's go here, make IP. Now let's see magic needs to reload everything. Tech, uh, magic, I have a script for that, flush all. Oh yes, yes. It doesn't like me doing all that. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's a command to do this faster, I haven't found it. I could uh, just exit magic and go in again, I guess, but... Uh, oh, come on. Yes, I know you have to... Yes, I don't. You do want to throw away everything. Yes, yes, yes. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> okay, I should have gone out. Let's see. Let's go back to magic. And now we can see everything is back to normal. And it's DRC LVS clean. Okay. So that's how I'm able to port to a different technology. And that's also how I was able to, let's actually add the 9-bit uh, SAR. Let's see, do we have it here? Oh, it's not there. Okay. Uh, cell place instance, is that one? Yeah. Dun dun, oh. We need sun with design. Actually, I don't want to do that. Design, design. And you want the 9 bit version. Okay. And let's select that and move that a bit so we can see. So when you download the um, template, for the analog designs, there is a def or a lef file. Let's see. So when you download the um, analog template, there you also need to download a uh, def file. S T T block. That defines all the ports and stuff and sort of the boundaries for your tiny tape out chip. And that's what you can see at the top here. You have the uh, outputs at the top and digital inputs, there's clocks also. And then at the bottom, you have the analog inputs. In addition, you need to define, you need to set the power. There's also descriptions on how to do that. I think I just uh, made a We'll modify the tickle script in order to generate the um, ports and metals for the power. Okay, so you can certainly find how to do this on the Tiny Tip Out website, but once you've done that, you sort of get the boundary, the area. And when I put my 9 bits are in, obviously it's not going to fit, <laughs> it's too big. So then I had to change my rules. I had to modify the CIC a bit, the um, object definition file. And in the object definition file, which is the ip.json, I created a, let's see, where is it? An 8-bit SAR. And then I had to modify slightly some of the routing because suddenly with a different size, things collided and so on. 
and I also added uh, something called uh, SAR capture because since the SAR core itself uses true single phase logic, the actual digital outputs of the SAR is not really retained for a long time. <laughs> you you kind of need flip flip flops at the output in order to capture the digital signals, and uh, that's something I had to add. So made a capture block that has just the flip-flops, which are also generated with the tool, and then a few hookups for the uh, sampling signal and the fact that I have two uh, sampling clocks, one for the bootstrap switch and one for the rest of the system because those have different reset states when you turn off the ADC. So then I was able to generate this 8-bit ADC relatively quickly and yesterday I spent the day <coughs> let's see delete that yesterday I spent the day on routing up the top parts here which is a capture block and that's I've just done in magic right so using the routing command which is actually quite good <laughs> in magic you can sort of route up the design yeah okay Let's see, let's go back to the uh, flow here. So I showed you now the CIC file. I didn't show you that, maybe I should show you that. So let's have a look at the thing that comes out for the compiler. IP sun design CIC. And this is a really, really long JSON file. It has the actual size of the rectangles. So rectangles for via. I think the first cell is here probably a via. So it's a metal three, metal four, two by two via. I use uh, instances for the wires, and then every single cell down in this. I don't know how long it is. How long is the CIC file? No. Mm. Yeah, 90,000 lines. <laughs> so that defines all the rectangles. And then CIC Py, the Python script, just translates that into magic files. So I generate the magic files. And that's pretty easy since they're text files. I love the fact that both magic and, and uh, X scheme uh, run, uses uh, text files. It makes it so easy to generate, much better. And, and then... Um, binary files and I also love the fact that you can actually modify the, your layout directly in um, a text editor so here you can see that's the magic file for the SAR capture it just has the definition of the rectangles and yeah lovely lovely so that's how I do the compilation but the hard part is, of course, writing these JSON files. Uh, Spice file is pretty easy. You can draw the schematic, and then you can extract it, and then place it uh, the lines as you want. So in this case, for example, it'll place the uh, first flip-flop here. Then, since it has a different name in the beginning, it'll place it next to it, and so on. And here, it'll place them in top of each other. And then in the JSON file, then yes, there's quite a bit of uh, stash you have to write in order to get all the routing correctly. So, in no way am I claiming it is easy, but I find it pretty cool what I can do. Uh, to actually change the size of my ADC and put it into a tiny tape out in about a week is something you cannot do any other way. Bit of an interruption in the recording. <laughs> I ran out of disk space. Docker had been too, uh, yeah, I don't know, relaxed with uh, using disk space lately, and I don't have the largest hard drive. Any, anyway, so I'm not claiming that it's easy. It's actually pretty hard to use the system. Um, as I said earlier, only a few other people have been able to do it, but if you can use it, and you can find an architecture, a circuit, that you can encode 
into a set of text files, it becomes fantastically easy to port. So, in the end, I actually made mm, some state-of-the-art converters. A student of mine also used the tool in order to make a even better ADC, and this you can you can show here. You can see here. I'll I think I'll put the slides in the uh, documentation uh, on the um, repository. But anyway, you can find the papers that describe his noise shapes are, and this is using the same compiler. So it's quite powerful. There's a couple of more things I wanted to just show, and let's actually go to the terminal. Let me bring that... Where did that go? Did I close it down? There it is. Just my uh, for reminding myself what I wanted to show. Okay. So, now you know how the input files for the ADC works. But if you're not doing that, it can still be useful to have a look at my setup. Uh, yes. So, from the template, you'll get a set of files. It'll be the docs file, the GDS folder, the left folder, and so on. And some are mandatory. I've chosen to place my design files in IP and let's look at that. Actually, maybe let's make it even bigger. So I have what I call my PDK. This is just borders and, and a few symbols that the compiler needs. I have my SAR and these are actually linked in as submodules. So here you can see I have my CPDK, I have my SAR which is a Git repo, and I have a technology folder. The technology folder is not really a part of the Skywater setup. It is just the scripts and stuff, the glue logic or the glue scripts uh, that I use in order to run DRC, LVS, parasitic extraction. It's all the commands I don't want to remember how to do that I write down and also quite a bit around the simulation because, of course, verifying your design is important. So let's have a look at the schematics. Inside the TT06R, you'll find the actual design. So if we do X scheme, B design TT, the naming convention for the design that's determined by tiny tape out. Where was the design folder? There we go. So that should include your GitHub username. Now, the schematic for the SAR is not really that interesting. So it only had two blocks. It has the SAR itself on the right side, and it has this capture block. And since the schematics are generated by CIC, they don't really look that nice. They don't they don't look as schematic should look. But that's because the design information is not encoded into a schematic. It is encoded into a spice file, and the spice file don't have enough information to make things pretty. So some of these blocks will just be quite hard to read. I have tried to redraw for some of them. So for example, for the bootstrap switch, I have redrawn the schematic in order to try and explain how it works. But for example, for these kind of things, there's no explanation. I think also for the comparator, yeah, I've tried to make it slightly uh, understandable how it actually works. So the half circuit for the strong arm, for example. But, yeah, if you try to read these schematics, I have to disappoint and say that it's not going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe changing the SAR is not going to be easy, but that's tough. That's how it is. But I only have these two blocks, so w all I needed to do in my, well, actually yesterday, was to route up these two blocks. And, of course, we do that in magic. So starting up magic, uh, magic. We already had a look at that. And let's expand. 
and in magic it is actually quite trivial to route things so you have you'll find tutorials on this you press the spacebar and then you click the uh, the metal that you want to route and then anytime you click again and now you can choose do you do I want to go up or do I want to go down in the metal it's sort of shift and then left button to go up and undo to undo or down button to go down and that way you can create routes to wherever you need to go so that's actually that's pretty good in magic compared to other tools that's pretty good and it's fast and the fact that you have DRC on the fly is also really cool so don't don't yeah so I've used I've used all the professional tools both mental graphics uh, synopsis and cadence and yeah don't this magic <laughs> magic is good it may look like it is from the 80s but that that is because it is but it is a good layout tool and it's fast so yeah just learn to know learn it and uh, use it maybe something to um, note you I can see if I remember to put this in so I found that reading the documentation was a bit tricky so I actually compiled the documentation into a github page so that has all the macros and stuff I'll, I'll put that link in the description if I can remember like that okay so that's the layout when we want to run DRC on LVS as I said I've written down those commands in my tech file so let's go into that make file here core make so DRC you can do in magic but I also have an option to do that on my command line make DRC uh, I think in this case it will do it for the top level so in my local make file it knows what the top level is and then it knows how to run the commands so when I make run make DRC it runs it these checks are not always perfect uh, it also can run K layout DRC but here if you have your own setup use that don't rely on mine if you don't need to but I find it you can have a look at the, the commands how it's done and how I do the LVS for example so XLVS will do the LVS for me and here is there's a couple of tricks like getting the right format for the netlist making sure it's an LVS netlist getting the getting magic to do the right thing when you extract it so I've made a tickle script for that and also I like the smiley face so I made a script to parse the output log from LVS and then give me a correct smiley face let's maybe make it incorrect should we let's take uh, select let's stay here and let's select that line and delete it and save it oh yeah just write everything that's fine and now we can run the LBS again and now it should be incorrect <laughs> hopefully and since we are working in uh, git then it's really easy to have a look to see what changed and this is why it's so beautiful to have um, text files so you can here you can see what actually changed and i should be able to just do git checkout my old design and run the lvs again and it should be correct let's close down magic so it doesn't write my files files again now since I generate the layout I can actually start most of the simulation directly on the presidic presidic constructed netlist in the uh, core.make file I've also got how I do that so it has an LVS tickle no sorry LP lp.tickle so I have a tickle script for magic 
And actually, side note. So Tickle is also the language of choice for most professional tools. So it is actually a good transfer of knowledge <laughs> between magic, learning magic, really learning magic, and the professional tools. Same go for, goes for XCAM. Learning XCAM is a good thing. It, it actually teaches you the professional tools. It will make the transition into Cadence, which is sort of, the, I guess, the gold standard right now, much easier. And when it comes to the backend tools, well, they use Tickle. So learning Tickle is a good thing. Anyway, this is the script I used to in order to generate the um, extract and netlist. I do send it through Perl in order to put in the right cell name and so on, so I don't have to do that every time. And that's just this Perl one-liner. I love regex, <laughs> regular expressions. And then you can sort of do this. And, and uh, once you write it down and get it right, you don't have to remember how to do it. All you need to remember is the command and then run the extraction. But of then, of course, we need to run simulation. And here it gets a bit more sort of tedious for analog designs because you have to run quite a lot of simulations in order to make sure that your design actually will work. So, actually, let me go to the readme file because I've started a verification plan. Maybe this is a bit big, but you can actually see it. So the verification plan I plan to do for my SAR ADC is, of course, to get the singleton noise and distortion ratio, the spruce free dynamic range, the effective number of bits, the active current, for both uh, typical fast and slow corners. And I also want to do that for uh, at least typical corner and RC extraction. And this is actually, since I'm doing directly on extracted, it is with C. And then I also want to make sure that when I power down and disable my ADC, then it doesn't consume power. That's kind of important, or that's... Well, I don't want to screw up in anybody else's design. Maybe the tiny tape out has some power switches. I don't know. Anyway, important. Let's see. Where was I going? Yes, test benches. So you have to write a verification plan, and you actually have to execute on it. And one part of that is checking multiple corners. So somehow you have to include the spice file for all the different corners that it is in the Skywater PDK. Now, I don't want to do that manually, and I don't want to have multiple test benches. So what I've done is create a Python script that reads my spice netlist, what you're looking at right now, which is a sort of very simple setup where I have my powering grounds, I have my enable signal, I have my clock signal, I have my input signals, and then I have a DAC to convert back from the digital output back into the analog. And then I save a bunch of things and then I run a transient. I have a, a Python script called, uh, well, I call it CIC sim. Some of my students call it six sim <laughs> that reads this file and it knows how to find the corner information because there's a YAML file in here that includes what I mean by layout which spice file is that, which uh, is the uh, resistive and the RC extracted layout, and which files are the schematic. Note that in the SAR, the capacitors, the actual CDAC is based on metal finger capacitors, which means that it's not possible to simulate on schematic. If I go in here and into the CDAC and into the CDAC and into the actual unit cell, which is sort of a 5-bit CDAC, you will see there are only metal resistors in there. So you can't simulate on the schematic, you have to simulate on the extracted netlist. But in the CIC sim folder, which links into the tech repo, it has a sort of a very simple YAML file for setting up what I mean by stuff. What temperature do I want to run? High or low? What voltage do I want to run? High or low? which spice files do I want to include? And here I discovered that um, if you include the sort of standard Skywater setup, TT, then it, it reads a bunch of files, almost 40 megabytes of spice files. And that 
takes quite a bit of time. So what I've done for my own <laughs> designs is only include what I need. So for example, when I run typical, uh, let's see, where's KTT? Yeah, these are the files that I include. So how does that work? Well, I go to my simulation folder. Now, TT06, simulation, TT is top level. And let's make it a bit bigger. And again, <laughs> as always, there is a make file. Because otherwise, I won't remember. And what I can do here is... Actually, I can run make test. Let's see what happened. So, <clears throat> first of all, when you run make test, it runs make typical with a debug option. So that means in the transient test bench, it'll run this part. And what the seek sim actually does is, actually, let's not do that. It generates an output tran directory. It generates a new spice file where it actually includes all the transistor, li uh, all the spice libraries. And then since I'm running uh, a debug, it'll do the define that is for debug. So comparing that to the other transient, you can see it sort of selected this line. So it's the same type of file, but the, the output test bench, this is actually what gets put into NDSpice. So that should be running, and you can see how I define the corners. So I just say 6sim run, and then the transient test bench, the options. So here it'll run typical, typical temperature, typical voltage, which is defined in the text setup. And transient up started. I guess this might take some time. Did I stop it? There we go. Yeah. So let's see. It's going to run for two microseconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's going to take some time. What should we look at in the meantime? Actually, I, uh, let's just kill it because the important part is just showing how I run my simulations. You may choose to do it any other way you want, but I like to do it this way because when I want to run extreme corners, which is a lot of corners, and maybe I won't do that for the SAR, it's maybe too many for the SAR, uh, too long simulation time, let's see, then I can easily specify to CSC sim how those corners should be run. And then it'll figure out the permutations and run all the corners. Once that is completed, then I can plot my results. So let's say Python, transient, pi, and I want my layout run, and I want the typical fast, slow. So when 6sim runs, it just generates a TFS run, a file of the outputs, the list of the outputs. And I can give that to a Python script, Actually, I forgot to plot it. Uh, yeah, the Python script just plots if you have a second option. And here I can see an FFT of my SARS in all the different corners. And what we can notice, uh, let's see. First of all, it's only running 128 points. Even that takes a bit of time. But we can notice that the effective number of bits, and let's look at, yeah, over here. We can see that is around seven bits. It actually is best for slow, low voltage, low temperature, which is a bit funny. There we get 7.5, but it's not that different. We can look at the harmonics, and here we could probably run even more points in order to get the quantization noise floor down and actually see the harmonics better. Let's see, we have a signal here, I guess around uh, 5, maybe. And that means around 10, yeah, this might be harmonic. But it's a quite high harmonic, so it looks decent. Okay, so once you're happy with the design, what I like to do after the, all the uh, simulations, and you can find actually a tutorial on how I simulate and so on. Uh, I'll put that in the description below. This is zero X HTML. Let's open that. And then I can get all my simulations. And 
I put in some specs in a YAML file for my ADC, and we can see that for layout, typical, and with RC extraction, it's okay. It's around 42 uh, dB. Notice that I'm running at uh, an amplitude of roughly minus 3 dBm. I'm oh, sorry, dB. And sort of referred to full scale, we're up to 45. So referred to full scale, the effect number of bits is slightly above 7, which I guess is okay. We might spend some time on nailing down exactly why. Maybe the next thing is doing an INL DNL, but that's quite time consuming. So let's see what I'll manage before the tape out. I guess I don't have, so I have had holidays this week, which is why I've had time to have a bit of fun and play with this and actually tape out. Once the design is okay, you know the LVS and DRC is okay, you actually need to generate the um, GDS. And let me just show you that. So I have a tickle script, which I might not have added. Let's see. Yeah, I've forgotten to add that. So now I've added that. And yep, modify the GDS. Actually, I don't want to do that. I don't want to add a new GDS yet. I want to fix some things first. But in the end, when you want to submit your design to Tiny Tape Out, you need a folder with a GDS. And inside the GDS folder, you need your design. There's a couple of things I want to fix before I commit the new version of the GDS. And one of them is I need to make sure that I uh, set the unused digital outputs to zero, or not to zero, but to, to a tie low. But pretty cool, I find. So a big thanks to um, Matt and Tiny Tape Out. Uh, it's been a cool experience and it's quite sort of uh, feels good <laughs> in order to, uh, find, to finally get to a, well, I'm not at the tape out yet. Uh, it's 55 days to the tape out closest, but at least I know I'm in on the design. There's a couple of small fixes I probably want to do, like the uh, digital outputs, but everything is DRC LBS clean. It looks good and fantastic ride. So everything's online. Everything's open source. Have fun, play with it. If you have questions, ask in the comments below, subscribe and all that stuff. And um, yeah, good luck with your own designs. Know that is possible. See you later.